Oh, the pressure of being on the internet. <laughs> you know you just love you. I know. <laughs> it's amazing how two people can see the very same thing and have two totally different perceptions of what took place. Whether it be an accident, a car accident, somebody describing what they saw, if it's a crime that took place, people's perception of what takes place can be totally, totally different. And when we talk about the cross of Christ, there seems to be many different views as to what took place at the cross. There were some who were there that uh, were very much in the know, that knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that they were crucifying the Son of God. There were others that came to that knowledge while they were doing it. There were some who wanted to do all that they could to make sure that uh, Jesus and his legacy was stamped out from the earth. But we know that the cross only began the greatest movement that this world has ever known. Amen. And that is the bringing of salvation to all mankind in Christ. So how do you view the cross? Flip over in your Bible to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Get your Bible out. You forgot your In verse 14, Paul says to the Galatians, he says, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I am to the world. What a wonderful thing he's telling us. He said, the only real thing, the only thing that I can boast in, the one thing that is most powerful in my life is the cross. And we see a transformation in Saul, Paul, that, that is uh, very much proof of the transformation that took place. He later writes to those in uh, Rome, he said, I, I want you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by letting the Word of God into your life to change you, to make you all that God wants you to be. He writes the letter to the Ephesians that they might grow up in, into a full man in Christ because of the cross. My friends, you can come to Jesus just as you are, but you're not going to stay that way. Jesus is going to transform you. He's going to clean up your life. He's going to make you into the image of God that God intended from the very beginning. God wants us to be good children. God wants us to be good, faithful followers of Him. And the only way that we can ever accomplish that or get to the point that we can start on that road is through the cross of Jesus Christ and the transforming power of the blood of Christ. And that what that story does in our lives will dictate whether we are merely somebody who believes that story or someone who lives that story. And I hope that after we go through our lesson today that you will be one who lives that story. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul made this startling statement. He said, I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He's saying that this is the summation of all that he's going to preach and teach while he's among the Corinthians. Do you remember what he said to the Romans? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's the cross. For it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He wants us to understand, my friends, that, that Christ is the center of all these things. I said, some people will listen, others won't. Some will think this is the dumbest thing that they have ever heard. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 23, he said, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and a folly, foolishness, to the Gentiles. Let's talk about several viewpoints. Let's start with the viewpoints of men. Probably the one that misunderstood the cross more than anybody else was Judas Iscariot. 
You see, when he saw Jesus, he saw the answer to uh, a political mess. And he thought that Jesus was going to deliver them from this political mess and that he would be in that kingdom. He would be one of the ones in power. And when he found out that Jesus was not a political figure, he was ready to sell him out. Now, I don't know, and I don't really understand if Judas knew how far his actions were going to take him. When he sold Jesus for those 30 pieces of silver, I don't think that he had in mind that they're going to kill him. They're just going to take him out and, and, and beat him or do something like that. His viewpoint was is that Jesus could be silenced. The Bible tells us in John chapter 12 that, that Judas, his character was, he was a thief. You remember when the uh, expensive ointment was used? He said, just think of how that could be sold and, and so much good should have been done. Really what he was trying to say was, just think if we could sell that and I could have the benefit from it. That's what he was thinking. He betrayed Christ as an opportunity to fill his purse. What will you give me if I give you Jesus? How is it going to help me if I give you Jesus? And I really believe that it went farther than he ever imagined. Mark this down. In all of the story of Judas Iscariot is, is this lesson. Sin, the devil's plan when he entices you to sin is always a lot bigger than what you think you're getting into. The devil's plans are much harsher, bigger, and will destroy much greater than you would ever think. You'll think a sin is just some innocent little harmless thing that's going to happen, but it's not. Sin keeps us from the very throne room of the God that we love. And it doesn't matter how tiny we think the sin is. Sin is sin. It separates us from God. Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5. Now, also during that time, there were those leading Jews who saw Jesus as a threat to their political uh, abilities. They, they really thought, well, you know, we're in power, and if Jesus comes to power, he's going to steal that from us. And we, we don't want that, so let's do everything we can to discredit him. So they start trying to trip him up in public every time he's out to preach. They'll send some group of people in there to heckle him and to try to catch him in some kind of logical fallacy or something like that. But Jesus is too smart. He already knows their heart and they cannot catch him. So what do they do? They go from wanting to just silence him to plotting to kill him. So they move gradually from just hating Jesus to wanting to murder Jesus and willing to pay someone to do that and that they would have that at all costs. Do we see the progressiveness of sin here? Oftentimes, sin will entice us with something that seems small and we'll soon find ourselves doing something that we thought, oh, I will never do that. But if you'll do one thing, the next one is not so hard. It's kind of like forsaking the assembly. You know, the first time that you, you don't attend service, it, it kind of hurts your conscience a little bit. Then the next time it gets a little easier, a little easier. Then several months go by, and pretty soon, I don't even think about going to church. I don't even think about things that are happening in the Lord's family. And, and I'm not concerned about the people who are part of that family. And so I have fallen completely out of duty. And it starts with just a little bit of negligence. Something innocent. But it became easier and easier and easier. So they plotted Jesus' death. Everything that they could do. If you would look in uh, John chapter 11. Here in John chapter 11 verse 47. So the, the chief priests and the Pharisees. They gathered the council. And they said... What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. One of them, Caiaphas, 
who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know, nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it is better that you, for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And he did not say this out of his own accord, but the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to kill Jesus. The chief priest, Matthew chapter 26, the chief priest and the elders of the people gathered in the palace to plot together. Can you imagine that? Getting a group of friends together, not just to discredit Jesus, but to plan his murder? Does that sink into your head at all about how much hatred and vitriol it takes to get a group of people together to sit down and figure out how are we going to kill this guy? These people are wicked to the core. All because they did not want to lose power. All because they could see that Jesus was the Son of God. But they didn't want Jesus as the Son of God. They wanted Jesus to, to be a political figure that would pat them on the back and allow them to remain in power and fill their pockets. So let's kill him. Let's get him out of the way. And you know what? It didn't work. <laughs> you see, when they... They killed Jesus. What did it do? It identified his believers. And on the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and began to preach, even those who were guilty of crucifying Jesus, many of them repented and were baptized that day and were added to the church. Those who were, were being saved and the church grew by 2,000, 5,000. It's, it's growing huge every day. And soon the persecution becomes so great that they're driven out of the city of Jerusalem and they go throughout all of the world. But before they're driven out, do you remember them standing before the council and the council saying, you will not preach this Jesus any, anymore. They put him in prison. They flogged them. They did all kinds of things to shut their mouths. And what does the Bible say? They counted it a joy to suffer for the cause of Christ. That they would suffer for the name of Jesus who died for them. The one who is raised to the right hand of God. You see, the cross made, made martyrdom something that was important. That I'm standing for Jesus. I am his witness. That's how important he is to me. So what they tried to do in stamping out Jesus, fan the flames of the kingdom. And it went everywhere. Everywhere they went, they began to preach and to teach. Never ceasing to preach and to teach. Never shutting their mouth. Every day, everywhere they went, they proclaimed the gospel. Acts chapter 5, verse 40 through 42. How about this man named Pilate? What was his view of the cross? His view was self-preservation. I would have liked to have known Pilate's wife. She had a dream, had an intuition. This is an innocent man. You should have nothing to do with him. But being a political figure, he knew he had to do something. So he tried everything he could to appease the people. He said, this is an innocent man. So he sends him off to be judged by their own counsel among the Jews that the Jews said, oh, what a compliment. They dressed him up, sent him back, beat him and sent him back and said, no, this is your problem to deal with. The people hated Jesus so much that when Pilate says he's an innocent man, he should go free, they, they said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. This is the same group who just a few days earlier were saying, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're saying, crucify him, crucify him. Oh, how fickle people are. Pilate thinking that he could cop out, I guess is the word, on this. Washed his hands in a ceremony saying, 
My hands are innocent of this blood of this man. No, you're not. You are just as guilty. You see, he sacrificed the, the life of Jesus to save his own life. What did Jesus say about that? The one who would save his life will lose it. So the one who gives their life for Jesus wins their life. And so it's completely turned around. What about the soldiers? The Roman soldiers. You see, after Pilate washed his hands, he has Jesus scourged, hands him over to the Roman soldiers, and they take him and treat him in the most brutal way that you can imagine. This Roman scourging, this... this beating that he takes, that he takes most people died from. Jesus was so mangled and brutalized that he was not even able to carry the cross on his own. The soldiers saw Jesus in the light of one to be mocked. They saw him as someone to make sport of. So they would blindfold Jesus and smack him as hard as they could and say, which one of us did that? Ha, ha, ha. They put that crown of thorns on his head. They beat him with rods. But even at the end, when the temple veil was split down from top to bottom, and the earthquake came, and the darkness covered the face of the earth. It was a Roman soldier that would say, truly, this was the Son of God. I don't care how dark your life is, how filled with sin it is. If you're like that Roman soldier, Jesus can turn the light on to your life calling you to change, to see that He is the precious Son of God. How do you see Jesus? All of these men saw Jesus in a different way. How about God? How did He see the cross? When you think about it, the cross truly is the story of the Bible. From the first the first opening pages of the Bible after man sinned, God said we will send Jesus to crush the head of the serpent. The serpent will only bruise his heel. So he begins this whole process of sending Jesus into the world at the point of when man needed it the most. As soon as they were separated from God, God had no plan in place. So Jesus tastes death for us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. See him who was made a little lower than the angels, while uh, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of his death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for us all. Look down in uh, Isaiah 53. Here he says, he took our sins upon himself. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied by this knowledge. Shall he have the, be the righteous one. My servant make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus was the propitiation. He was the go-between. He was the one that satisfied God's anger and justice over sin. What is the wages of sin? Death. Jesus paid death. He died so that we don't have to. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9 talks about Jesus being the propitiation for our sins. Not just ours, but whoever would come to Jesus. In, in Hebrews chapter 5, we learn that Jesus' view of the cross was just like his baptism to fulfill all righteousness. 
He knew that this was what he, he was supposed to do. Do you remember in the garden when Jesus was, was wrestling with the upcoming death? He said, Father, if there's any other way that this can be accomplished, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So the cross was, in Jesus' view, a way to submit to the Father, a way to be what God wanted him to be. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. interesting when he was standing before Pilate that Jesus makes this statement that you know at my beckoning call to the Father twelve legions of angels would come and free me that's not my Father's will I'm here dying for my people I don't have to but I willingly lay down my life for my sheep. Jesus saw this as an opportunity to serve you, to serve me. That's the view of the cross. That is so beautiful. Him who knew no sin, God made to be sin so that we might become his righteousness in him. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 21. Jesus endured the cross. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Jesus humbled himself. Being counted equal with God, he humbled himself, gave up that position. He took the form of a human being and, and died the death of the most uh, heinous criminal on the earth, the death of crucifixion. And he did that to humble himself for the Father. Is it any wonder that the Prince of Peace, the, the humble Prince of Peace, would call for us to be humble? For us to be meek? For us to submit to the will of God? For us to change our lives to be like Him, to become more like He is? Jesus died, why? To purify me. To sanctify me, Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14, having their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's why Jesus died. Jesus died in order to purchase his kingdom, to pay for you and me. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. With his own blood, Jesus purchased the kingdom. He died on the cross to demonstrate God's power. You see, through the power of God, the one who died, God rose up again. Do you know that it's that same power that resurrected Jesus out of the grave that transforms us in the watery grave of baptism? We go from lost to saved, dead to alive, risen to walk in newness of life. My friends, we've got to understand that, that baptism in and of itself does nothing. It's the fact that we come into contact with the blood of Christ in baptism, that our sins are washed away, and there is no salvation outside of the blood of Christ. In fact, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 tells us that we are baptized into Christ, into his death. Yes, baptism is just as much a part of our salvation as any believing, <coughs> repenting, confessing, they're all important. But Jesus saw this as a time to be submissive. He saw it as a time to, to demonstrate God's power. He saw it as a time to save you and me. What about the rest of us? <coughs> when I talk about the cross, I talk about it in a far different way than most of the people that I meet at the coffee shop or restaurant or whatever. People out in the world, they, they just don't get this cross thing. They just don't get the suffering servant. But I always try to get them to look at 
the idea of Romans chapter 5. That even though I don't deserve it, even though I am a sinner, God still loves me. <clears throat> and therefore, He gave Jesus to die for my sin. And so I live every day indebted to Jesus to preach, to teach, to live, to love, to treat others the way that Jesus would have me to treat them. There's a lot of people that are not easy to get along with. You notice that? There's some people that, man, just being around them is the most negative thing in the world. And Jesus said, you know what? Love them anyway. I have learned that probably the people that are most grumpy and hateful are bearing some of the heaviest burdens. And what they need more than anything is not for us to judge them and say and telling them what a horrible person they are for being mean, but to show them that God loves them and that I'm here to help you in any way that I can. Jesus did that for you? What are you doing for him? <coughs> Answer that question all together.